Hello everyone, welcome back to the Orange Domino podcast after like a year, I think, near enough. Yeah, it's been a very long hiatus. I mean, I've done a couple like late last year, but I don't think, unfortunately, Mike was not part of it, but um, we're, we're back now. We're, we're back. So back. We are back. We are so we are back. back. We're so fucking back. <laughs> Today we're joined by uh, our good friends, uh, Chris and Sean Munn. How are you guys? Doing good. How are you doing? Coastal. Still what? Coastal and superior. Nice. Um, yes, so today we're going to be talking about um, the disastrous effects of artifi artificial intelligence and uh, a little bit of societal burnout and the like. So um, to get the ball rolling, the domino effect... Uh, AI photos. How do, how do we all feel about that? Well, on the one hand, I see AI as a really good tool for photo creation and for expanding creativity and what you can do with just a simple photo, you know, blowing it up into something more. But like we were talking about just before, you know, we started, uh, where does AI stop when it comes to pulling for ideas? You know, where where is its where does it where does it see a limit you know what does it see our personal like cloud storage and stuff as somewhere it can pull from because that's on the system or part of the system so it's you know something it, it sees as it's as it's or does it understand that that's private domain and not public domain yeah because um i've had some experience with adobe products and i think Towards the end there, like the last few months, they were talking about, oh, agree to our terms and conditions if you'd like to be part of the AI, you know, learning program where we take bits and pieces of your photo and can use it for Firefly, which is like their AI image generator. So I thought that was a little weird. And um, again, like before we started, Chris was saying it, there's going to be start. We're going to start seeing more legal problems and implications and stuff. And I feel like that's going to be one of them. Like we're going to have to. Um, not submit, but like comply with their terms and conditions if we want, you know, to use their service. It's, it's like signing away your likeness. Um, in my job, you know, a lot of the stuff we do gets filmed um, mm -hmm. for for promotional purposes, for educational purposes, and we always have to sign a release that says, "Hey, we're going to use your likeness." So I'm I'm a little leery, uh, so of of any program that wants my likeness for whatever reason likeness that's weird yeah like what's the, the other thing that oh go ahead go ahead no 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 uh, the other thing that i think about is like um in it happens in my job a lot right like there was an issue a couple months ago where the local county chair was clearly overseas and people were using ai snippets of his voice to make uh, uh phone calls canvassing for candidates saying he was home and he's working on this. He's clearly overseas. What? Yeah. So it's really... Yeah. So wait, were employees then, doing that or just random people? Random people out in the community. Isn't that like election in interference? It, it really is. <laughs> That's <laughs> so scary. It, it got reported up, but uh, it's scary. And as I understand it, you can take, I don't know, three or four sentences of someone speaking and be able to AI spoof their entire voice out of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you can, um, like, kind of continue with Chris is saying, like, he, um, I, people have been, like, using AI to, like, prank call people, like, um, mimic, like, loved ones' voices and stuff, and they'll be like, yep. oh, I'm in trouble, and I need oh, yeah, that's $2,000 and stuff, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and then you get scammed uh, because you think, oh, your best friend is in trouble, but it's just an AI voice. Yeah. Yeah. Recently, I read an article where uh, I guess somebody in Maine was arrested and charged for using AI to generate uh, the president's voice and tell saw that story. voters not to go to the polls, not to vote for this specific election in Maine. And it was an attempt to like just basically make it a one-sided election, like a landslide election for yeah. uh, for this one candidate. That's messed yeah. up. It is. Well, it'd be like, and, and it, I think I've even hear like where people have, like you know, the AI voice that could say like Biden or Trump's voice, and then they just like make up something and 
put it on uh like Online. a call and they could yeah. do that like you yeah. could go and be like pretend to be president biden and be like oh don't vote for me because i'm dropping out of the race or some <laughs> shit and that could actually you know interfere with the election oh yeah it'd like directly impact it yeah. um what but saddens it, me it leads... no sorry mike oh no go ahead go ahead no, I was just going to say what saddens me is like, you know, a fake robot voice in the old days used to be like, hello, this is Robin Williams. Yeah. Yeah, it like it sounds was, like it was obvious, you know. Now it's and so, so lifelike that you can't tell the difference. It's like a um, very thin border between, oh, that's cool, and, and that's a little and concerning. Up, and it brings up another I, thing that, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the one thing, I, um, like, kind of like, you know how we were talking like photos and everything. I kind of agree with Mike before where like I think AI photos can be beneficial in the sense of like, you know, because, you know, a lot of us here are like artists or like filmmakers and we want to, mm -hmm. let's say you want to use AI to make up like concept art or like an idea of kind of like how you want a scene to look. I think that could be good. And actually they use it in the industry. I've been told like my one of my uh, instructors and film school told me about how they use that for like concepts and i think that's good because it you know then you if you're not an art like you're not someone who can draw really well then you can just go into ai and generate an image if you want to have mm -hmm. like a storyboard or something so there is a benefit to it but i also think people take it far and it also um like prevents like artists you know from who are like really talented from actually being able to make art when ai can make stuff that's just as good as that and instantaneously so that, uh, too it doesn't seem fair, on, does on it? A, mm. Let me, let me be clear. Track. Let me be clear. Um, obviously, I use a lot of AI stuff for the analog horror um, videos I do. And uh, sometimes, like, AI voices, but not, like, other people or, like, dead relatives. It's just weird. Um, so, yeah, I do agree that it can be beneficial to smaller creators that may not have as much access to those facilities. But there is a fine line between like smaller creators and then big corporations like Disney using it for the Loki season two poster or, you know. So on that boy, they used AI so they, for that? On that same yeah, track. They did. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to interject here. on that same track. Um, a while back, there was a big, big debate in Hollywood about, and it was actually right around the time Rob Williams died about how far or them taking AI too far when it comes to using the voices of dead celebrities. So the argument was that these people, you know, have, have obviously passed away and their families should have a say as to whether or not their likeness, especially their voice, is continued to be used at long after their death for for profit, for these companies to profit off of. And and the corporations were basically saying, well, no, like we have hours and hours and hours of them from stuff they did for us when we were alive. We don't have to ask your permission because we can just pull from our archives and use AI to generate their voice. So you no longer you're like your your relative is dead, that's sad, but you are no longer part of this conversation. And so the 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 conversation came up of like is using AI to generate like Robin Williams' voice or you know another dead celebrity wasn't going too far. Wasn't one of the first celebrities uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman for Hunger Games? I remember hearing about. Yes, it. I, like, I think so. I've, watched I've never watched that series, but I remember he yeah. was one of the first to be like quote unquote resurrected. And then I think they Wait, used archived. He? Yeah, they used archived footage of him. Like they had the material, but like they kind of didn't do a few scenes. I guess. I, 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 like I think, Leia. Like, they recorded in the most of it before. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I think they did the same thing with Dumbledore. Actually. They recorded most of his stuff before he had passed away, and then after the actor that played Dumbledore passed away, they just continued on and like finished it up, well, or, or they, something uh, like that. Well, for Dumbledore, the original actor Richard Harris, he died uh, after they filmed. Like it was just before the second one came out. So then they recasted him with that other actor who actually just Michael Gambon. Yeah, Michael right. Gambon. Who and then Michael Gambon. Just, he just recently passed away himself, like uh, yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, it was last year. Oh, I don't remember who I was, who I'm thinking of, but there was an actor that passed away like mid movie, and they had already done most of it. They were like in the last ten percent, and they used AI to finish up his dialogue. Oh, Paul Walker, Gary Fisher, Paul, 
Fast and Probably Furious. Paul Walker. His yeah. brother finished yeah. a few scenes. Uh, you can tell. Yeah, yeah, both of his brothers, and they use CGI right. to do it. Because I, I also feel like, do you guys think there's like a like because there's I feel like there's AI and then there's CGI like. Do you think there's like? A oh yeah, that's another thing that I really. Like... I want. I want to rage a little bit here. Um, <laughs> oh, because AI is such a buzzword right now. Like I don't know what the yeah. correct term would be, like keyword or whatever. Um, there's AI everywhere. Ever since 2022, um, it's just in places where it doesn't necessarily need to be in, and anything that has. You know, because when I think of artificial intelligence, I think of HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey. But then you have these people who are like, ooh, you know, my photo got cleared up in Lightroom or Photoshop. It was artificial intelligence, AI program. And it's really not AI. I don't think so. It's just like programs. Artificial intelligence, I think, is more so, you know, like chatbots or... Um, maybe a program that can design a website from scratch, you know, stuff like that, like actual intelligence. The word yeah. AI is just thrown around too much, and it's sort of like so, a, a shiny object, because like, oh, AI, like, oh, this is this is hip, this is modern, this is new. Oh, yeah, and so of I mean, course everybody, you're like click you on said, it. everybody is trying to shove it where it doesn't necessarily need to be. It's like right. everything has have some kind of artificial intelligence or some kind of way of connecting wirelessly to the network. And it's like, for what purpose? Yeah, like Amazon features, reviews. We don't need yeah, I, I do agree. Because like um, on um, uh, Photoshop, like, and this is something that we actually went over last semester in my editing class in film school. You could use, like, there's certain, like, AI tools that you could use to, like, uh, I don't know, like, like instant get rid of the background instead of having to cut out or whatever with the tool and stuff. And they classify as AI. And I think to a point, I guess you could say it's AI, but I really feel like it's just a programmed tool. Yeah. Because it's hard to say that that's AI. Now, there is a there is a tool that Photoshop has where you can actually generate images with AI. Yeah. Firefly, so right? That, one of our I, new computers. Yeah, Firefly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of our new so, computers that we got in at work has it, and the demo for it, they were ju they just typed in "lion in space," and it generated this like gorgeous, high definition image of a lion standing on like Neptune with a crown and a sword in space. Like it was really, really highly well done. That's the kind of stuff that I like seeing AI do. That's that's what I think AI should be used for. Oh yeah, yeah I agree, but I also feel like. I can see where a lot of artists or people who spend hours trying to draw that or whatever would be pissed because it's like this machine can do it instantly, and yet it takes a real person hours, you know, to do. Mm -hmm. Seems like a bit of a cheat, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, and it, and I feel like in our society currently, and I feel like it's just how things are going. We always, I think, people just want the cheat, like the easy kind of way out, and I feel like now we're getting to a place where it's so easy. To just yeah. do that easy way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like you can just be like, "Oh, um, AI, generate me, uh, you know, um, a, a, a script about this," and they can. And, and they you can, can actually, actually generate that. do that too. Um, Chat GPT can do like little mini scripts for free. Yeah, yeah. It can, and you can just get it to uh, generate. And um, like I've been curious, and I've tested that out before. Now most of the stuff is very robotic sounding, and just. Not kind of, good, yeah. but but like um and now we're actually in a point where like schools like even my college um they warn against like like as if you get caught using chat gbt for like an essay or something you can be like you can get in trouble for that and i think even like high schools are now trying to like crack down on that they're actually yeah, building they systems to, to be able to uh, catch on chat gbt have you ever chat... seen those memes where it's like I fed Chat GPT ten hours of romantic comedies and asked yeah. it to write me a script, <laughs> and they're just so unhinged. Like the entire way through, it's just nothing but like if it was an actual movie, you'd be sitting there going, "What the fuck?" for the entirety of the entire movie. Somebody did that for '60s Batman, and it was pretty on point for '60s Batman. But you could tell it was just wild. Oh yeah, That's because '60s so, like, Batman and got... Chat GPT were both on acid. <laughs> 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 the thing is with the thing is with ChatGPT, like it's not at a point where like if you like I said, if you try to get it to make a story, it doesn't make sense. Like it's not gonna make 
a lot of sense. It's gonna drag. It's gonna have weird aspects. But yeah. mm-hmm. I think ChatGPT could get to a point where it can develop like full blown stories. I mean, look, yeah. AI. I think even with AI, we're gonna have a point where I think people will literally use AI to just make like cartoons. Like if like, oh, you know what? You know, we never got. Uh, another season of Spectacular Spider-Man. So AI make me Spectacular Spider-Man season three, and it might be able to do that eventually. Yeah, and um, they were, I mean, from two years ago when the video AI stuff started, compared to now, it's like a whole different uh, yeah. world. It is, and it's very. In, I mean, some of it, not all of it, but some of it's very uh, indistinguishable like from and reality. realistic. And I feel like one day, because, you know, we always talk about AI photos and then the artists and everything, but I think we filmmakers are next because you could oh, just I say, agree. you could do a prompt like, oh, a bald man in a, you know, in the desert and make Dune 3 or 4 or something. And like we uh, stated I before. I was thinking Walter White, but. Walter White, yeah. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with the bald stuff, but um, I... you could put in prompts and like we stated before that ai stuff can't really create anything new it's going to take so if you From wanted a movie that made. looked like dune you can get dune if you wanted a movie that looked like a racer head you know you got it yeah yeah i think i think it's it's crazy and it's actually really bad because like that's we were talking about we actually talked about this in one of my classes like the fear is that we'll get to a point where they don't need to make you know films anymore. Like they don't need that. They don't need to spend. Oh, why do we spend millions of dollars to hire crews and and destroy stuff and spend all this money to make a movie if we can just get AI to make it within seconds mm-hmm. and uh, we can profit off of that. So I don't think we'll. I don't know if we'll get to the point, at least in our lifetimes, where AI completely dominates like the film industry. I think it's going to get to a point where it might. It might be more ai films and regular films but i still think people still will want that regular film it's just hard to say what's gonna happen because ai really launched like during covid and it's changed so much within the last two three years so how so we don't know how much it could advance within the next two you know like another two or three years yeah let alone a lifetime Mm. along that same kind of line of thinking you got have you guys ever watched uh star trek uh, which one? Which one? <laughs> uh, just any of them. Hollow Deck. Yes. Yes. Oh, hey, Professor Moriarty, it, you're it, right. Simulations where you can tell it, computer, give me a ballroom circa 1926, you know, the good years or whatever. And it will give you before, you know, the bubble burst, 1920 speakeasy and you're in it. And you're living it, and the AI is generating real, real-ish people that are interacting with you and talking with you. Uh, best, perfect example is from uh, Star Trek: Next Generation, First Contact, the movie First Contact. Uh, oh yeah, Captain Picard and the woman Ensign that he's with. Lynch. Uh, Ensign Lynch, yes. Yep. Well, when him and her go in there. He winds up in this simulate this hollow simulation that he's been in a bunch of times, and one of the holograms actually walks up and slaps him in the face and calls him a cheating bastard or something before stor- she storms off. And he's like, Ruby! So he's had like full interactions and like, you know, love interests and stuff inside this AI generated hollow deck. Mm-hmm. There's another episode and- where they do Sherlock Holmes. Professor Moriarty comes alive and tries to kill everyone. Hey, yeah, oh, I love that approach. Actually, you know, that's um, a good point. So, like, <laughs> when does AI? When do we? When do we reach a point where we we realize that AI has to have a parameters? Limit. Yeah, that we can't exactly that we can't just constantly feed it an endless supply of information. No, I don't it's, think. Go ahead, Chris. I was. Gonna, I don't think uh, the people who make our public policy are really aware of what it is yet to do that mike which annoys me because we've had so many movies terminator and you know all these different films and projects and even stories like i have no mouth and i must scream like genuine sci-fi yeah. horror stories that could become reality like uh um elon musk's brain chip or whatever it's called 
uh, you know, you could have advertisements yeah. in your brain, and you know, like people could like shut you off with the switch of a button. It's like, why would you? When I heard of Elon Runner. Musk's brain chip, all I could think of was the iPhone from Futurama, where they like install <laughs> it by impaling it into your eye. Yeah, is that why Crazy. they call it the iPhone? <laughs> Yeah, it is actually. You you don't have a choice of carrier. It only comes in one color, and it gets terrible reception. Hold still and spikes it into his eye. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I I think it's a little bit nuts, and I think we're going a little too fast. And I think AI needs to be regulated. Like it can't just be allowed to do whatever it wants. Yeah, it needs sure. to be restricted and regulated, and. Um, it needs to like for certain things you can be used and for certain things it needs to be just outright banned like, um, i remember earlier this year or late last year there were pictures going online about like inappropriate pictures of taylor swift that were ai generated i think it was around the time of the super bowl and yeah they got the i think the white house and joe biden commented on it or something and i think that yeah. because of that there's gonna have to be um well yeah legal stuff put into place you could just be like, oh, you know what? Um, you and, and worst part is you can kind of blackmail people, so you can have like a picture of yourself. Yeah. And someone and someone can just uh, AI generate, you know, uh, nudity onto that, and just be like, oh, uh, you know, that's happened. Look, and share it around. Yeah. Uh, people could kill yourself. themselves over that. People are making it yeah. like it's like a revenge porn thing, and and it's tied up in litigation right now, but. Yeah, There's been at least yeah. one story. I'll have to find it. People use it to make nudes or lewds, and, and it's nothing good. Yeah, it's 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 actually really bad. It's like too much power and too easy, if that makes any sense. Like, you could just, with a few prompts, you could just right. end, end people's lives or reputation or whatever. Yeah, because right. it's like, yeah, okay, you can, you can have you a can picture ruin, of your... I could take you a can ruin of thousands of people's lives. Literally. I could take a picture of Dom where, I don't know, he's just doing something and then just, oh, I'm just going to AI generate this so then his... Oh, make him shirtless. You know, shirtless or his, you know, he's nude and, and oh, and you owe me, you could give me $3,000 or else I'm going to share this around. And... and you see, back in the day, it used to just be you took somebody's face, you cropped it, and then you photoshopped it onto, like the body of a well-known porn star or something right it's like if you don't pay me i'm sending this around and that was enough oh, yeah. yeah and and now everyone's like yeah that's that's bullshit that's fake Everyone right and it was it. like demonstrably awful and you know it was like tom holland on a hemsworth like it doesn't work <laughs> what the fuck? oh yeah <laughs> oddly specific right <laughs> not that we know or anything yeah <laughs> um which kind of segues into a neck another subject that i wanted to discuss was um like video manipulation and uh government propaganda because you know you've had presidential voice changers and whatnot for years and like oh obama said uh, let me be clear I'll take off your clothes and you know stuff like that and then um but nowadays even with Light the skibbity toilet. Yeah, even with the, the deep fakes. That's another thing, deep fakes. Um, you know, like, oh, Trump said that, Biden, Putin said he's going to release nukes. Um, and not only that, but the general public and how they uh, conceive of it or, you know, how they're either aware or unaware, especially with older people and maybe even younger people, yeah. too. I think there's only a select few... Uh, amount of people that actually know like oh yeah that's fake i worry about the population like a boomer on facebook mm -hmm. who who might not know the finer points of it or what to look for in an ai image even one yeah, that might be a little actually, shakily put together this actually brings up a point that i was talking to my dad about earlier today and it's that i think that most modern ai that exists currently when they built it, I don't think they ever thought about putting in a uh, how would would how what, how did I say it earlier? Like a watermark? like a regulator. So so it's being fed all of this misinformation, disinformation, uh, incorrect information, and it's looking to see like the AI is looking to see whether or not it's actually true. It's trying to fact check it. 
but the problem is it's coming across all these people that are sharing and liking and commenting about this misinformation. And so it's leading the AI to believe that it's true. And so it's it, it's it's learning, but it's learning the wrong stuff and we're reinforcing it to learn the wrong stuff and when we try to correct it it tells us no that's not right because all these people said that it's this hmm. it can be easily corrected and it doesn't know difference it's like it's super intelligent but it's also really dumb yeah which is like you know people misusing it and yeah, exactly. It, so, like, like Meta, is, Facebook, and Meta is a perfect example. Meta is Facebook's AI that they created to like basically run Facebook, um, while Mark Zuckerberg went and did other things. Well, Meta has been slammed countless times for passing and like propagating fake information and misinformation, simply because it doesn't know enough to separate opinion from fact and is assuming that people's opinions are fact because it's finding those opinions shared amongst a bunch of other people. Yeah. Can I jump in here real quick on Go something? Ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a story a couple months ago. I think I'm trying to find it, I think on the Brennan center, which does a lot of election related things, but they tested three or four, like election information things with three or four with a bunch of AI, I guess programs they are, and they said, "Okay, when's election day?" And these these AI crawlers went out and they came back and and to your point, Mike, they came back with, "Well, election day is a thing that happens every so and so," but a lot of them came back with the wrong date. Hmm. So there's no quality. I'll try to find the article and drop it in the chat, but right. there's no so like, guardrail on it. it. Exactly. It can't dif it couldn't differentiate between presidential election, state election, uh, co uh, uh, election for senator, election for congressman. Like they are all different days of the year. So it's right in the sense that uh, with, with it could be right with any of these days, but it's not right because it it doesn't have like all the parameters or the intelligence to find the correct answer. Yeah, like the yeah. precise date. Um, that's why I think with chat, oh, I can't talk, chat GPT, um, whenever you ask it a question or anything, sometimes like at the bottom it says, do not accept legal or medical advice as we're not, you know, it's not a <laughs> lawyer or a, a medical practitioner licensed. A good old or CYA. Yeah. Chat GPT is the new WebMD. Literally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but that, that's true. I don't know. I think like because you can manipulate things, you could. Um, Who watches could the watching? Yeah, you could you could manipulate Chat GPT into thinking that into believing something that isn't right. Like I said, it's where propaganda can come in. Like I don't know, like a, a certain person running for office or president or whatever or whatever they're. Their idea they could use that to propagand like oh you know chat gpt says that uh you know the, the election's rigged and this and that and you can really and you could and you could use it also to make like propaganda videos or to push your mm -hmm. your you know your idea to get votes or whatever you want to do they um they've also been kind of getting a bit more strict with it because i noticed with adobe firefly you can't say certain things because it gets automatically flagged Really? Um, yeah, and then with ChatGPT, like, there's been some like edge lords on online trying <laughs> to make it say certain things. Um, and I think there was this one reel or TikTok or something about trying to get ChatGPT to do a uh, a 9/11 AI generated photo, and obviously it wouldn't. But if you so that's kind of like Mike. It kind of reminded me of what you were saying. Like, you know, it has these things put in the place, but you could also kind of corrupt it and work yeah, depending around on it. How you word the cor the question mm -hmm. or word the request, it well, will it'll it, give you what you want one way or another. You just have to find workarounds. For yeah, it. and that, oh, yeah, that's the scary thing. 
prompts. That's, that's a scary thing too because it knows exactly what you're saying and it can show you those things, but it won't because of the you know the rules or whatever that's been put into place by Adobe or you know uh, ChatGPT. So exactly. Just to finish what I was saying, that they um, if you do kind of work around it, it will eventually show you like you know a dumb 9/11. Uh, AI generated thing or some other obscene imagery, but you know you just got to know what to say and how to say it. Well, you can actually some people are master like some people have spent months and stuff trying to actually like learn prompts because if you if you get really good at like prompts and you know what to say, yeah, you can get really cool and interesting um, designs from AI from different kind of AI generated websites and chat gpt because i know for the most part chat gpt also restricts like swearing but you can kind of play around with it mm -hmm. if you wanted to get it to yeah. swear or a customer sexual stuff. a customer that came in the store recently that was taking some courses online from mit and a few other places about ai to learn more about it she said that uh, one of the things that when you're using AI, you have to ask it to ask you questions because then the AI will start to ask for more detail and more parameters and it can get a more accurate description to what you want. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I always noticed and was kind of annoyed about. Like if you were kind of if you were to say to Chat GPT, "Hey, how you doing?" They'd be like, "Hi, how are you? How can I help you today?" And then you know you would just try to have a normal conversation. It's constantly asking you questions to try to you know learn stuff. Yeah, it wants to learn because then it can create more stuff. That's how these programs have been able to you know like recreate things or mm -hmm. manipulate. Right, or but that kind of sketches me out a little bit because the more questions that it asks you the more it learns and as it's storing this knowledge it no longer has to ask those questions because it already has the answer and now because it already has the answer it can think of new questions to ask you and at some point it's gonna ask a question that either you don't have an answer for or it doesn't like the answer for and then where are we absolutely which is kind of like hell 9000 from a space odyssey or any other generic, you know, evil android or robot movie or story. Because, uh, like, the elephant in the room here, when does it become sentient? That's And that's the thing that scares my father. He's 67, and when it comes to AI, he does not trust it because he... He thinks – he his brain immediately goes to the movie I, Robot with Will Smith. Mm -hmm. He is – afraid that it is going to become sentient and it is going to enslave us and it, you know, that really we're going to become redundant in its eyes which it kind really of could. oh god gotcha. no i was gonna say it really could because we're in a point where um like we like we always would say like oh look at these movies where like robots take over and everything that's never gonna happen you know we're not gonna have these things and now we have like ai that can generate stuff and i think that and we already have robots like people have created robots that can already like have these intelligence and they actually joke about enslaving humans and obviously that's stuff that's probably in program programmed into them as well but i think that's a point that we could actually have like full-blown robots that are sentient enough to basically take over us or, or we could have a scenario like um detroit become human where robots live beside us and they do the jobs we don't want to do mm. and stuff and there already is that like robots um there's certain like um stores now or like or like operations where they're just using robots to do the labor instead of hiring people so that actually takes people out of jobs and uh you know, because you get free that's, labor. We'll you get, that's the other thing to think about. You say that, and my brain, because you had said, you know, you, you were saying robots becoming sentient and, like, either enslaving us or living next to us like Detroit Human. But I was going to say the flip side of that coin is I don't know if you guys heard the story of the Tesla that hit and struck the uh, robotic security attendant in California. Did it? <laughs> so it was like a it was like a park security attendant, and it was going around at the end of the day, letting p patrons know the park was closed and they needed to move along. 
it went off a footpath onto the road slightly to go around a a blockage in the footpath and when it did a tesla that was coming down the street the tesla's like a uh, person detection didn't recognize the robot as a person and just slammed into it Damn, probably because it didn't have and a pulse or anything. And it out, and it was, like, setting off its distress alarm. It called the police and everything because it was being tampered with. Good lord. What were you going to say, Chris? Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to say, uh, you raised an interesting point from a labor standpoint. I don't think AI is at a point of sentience yet. I think there's still a lot of heavy programming built into it. Um, if you've been to, like, a Skyline Chili lately... They have a robot that brings you your stuff, which is kind of cool, but kind of depressing for the people there that are actually working. Well, mm. um, Tesla's can actually, like with Tesla's, be, you know, you can actually like go on your phone and call the Tesla over the night. Like they can, you know, it can drive to you. Like a valet. You know, you got, so it's like, yeah, it's like, like self-driving mechanics. Mm. Um, I know they're at a store that- Tesla, might, come to me. In, <laughs> Runs right through the building. And there's a store that. That's how I drive on Fortnite. At a mall. <laughs> there's a store at a mall near me, and uh, like, if you want, because everything like, like, you have stuff on display, but if you wanted like, it's like a sports store, and if you wanted like, I don't know, let's say shoes or something, you'd have to put like the order, and then a robot takes the shoes and puts it into a bin, and then gives it. Like it's mm -hmm. really like that feels freaky. soulless. I'm gonna. I, I do want to. I want to expand awful. on this on uh, when we go to, over to societal burnout because I, I do want to have a few rants about that. Um, but I guess just to because it seems like that's where we're going. Just to finish up on the the AI stuff. Uh, what I was telling you, Mike, the other day about the um, to finish up what you were saying about your dad and like enslaving us and everything. Uh, we we live in a digital dark age where you know, the internet and technology is our uh, modern-day library of Alexandria, and we have all human knowledge, pretty much, on the internet, and we have all of our personal stuff. I think um, Sean and I, and I guess, I mean, everybody here in this uh, podcast right now, we were kind of like the last generation to have uh, family photos in, uh, like, physical printed photos and whatnot. Everything now is digital. And it really makes you think that if, you know, because even books are becoming digital, movies, streaming, yep. a lot of physical media is oh, kind yeah. of being phased mm -hmm. out. If AI I, uh, or... I like a, oh, sorry, uh, real quick. Uh, like if AI or a you know, tech billionaire, Lex Luthor or anybody, were to take over, um, and or even if a solar flare were to happen and the internet were to go down, a lot of stuff, a lot of knowledge and yeah. human progression would be lost. So I think that's well, why yeah. physical media is important. There's a too much, I think, on technology. Too there's much a, on... Go ahead, Mike. There's a fantastic George Carlin, uh, George Carlin skit. It's at the end of his special, uh, Life's Worth Dying, and he talks about how, like, if it, it's like it's this big progression of just, like, it starts with the power going at, the power going out and how the power controls everything and so it just builds into this bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger thing until it just completely explodes you know globally basically mm -hmm. and and it's 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 right along it's along the same line where it's just like you know if if electricity and and the internet went down most of our infrastructure would completely crash Oh yeah, banks, uh, even you know, like restaurants. Because at, at my store, if the internet goes off or if like the server goes down or you know anything, everything's ooh on the mobile app. Everything's connected to the the server online. Yeah, it's like people. And now we're at a time where people like order their food online and they literally now you got and it's just like it's crazy because everything is just so connected to not just the internet but electricity. Like if everything were to suddenly crash we would literally be sent to the freaking stone age like that's just how it is because mm. we don't know recently, we're all without this stuff and a lot and of so, yeah, recently we had a power outage at my workplace and mm. they came the power came back on shortly thereafter but it knocked our network offline and so we couldn't take credit cards or debit cards we could only take cash or check mm -hmm. and people were just completely 
baffled oh. and lost. They didn't know what to do. And they couldn't go to an ATM to get cash out because the ATMs were off networked. Like it was a it was a regional problem that the network was just down. Yeah. So some of the local ATMs were down too. People were just had no clue what to do. I'm guilty of that. I never really carry cash with me, but there are times where um, it is handy. It is handy to have like physical money with you. Oh yeah, I, I think it's nice somewhere. to have. If I'm going out somewhere with people, I will take out like forty or sixty dollars in cash just to have in case like something comes up and they don't accept card and it's a cash only kind of thing. Yeah. Or I if paid... I had the tip or something, you know, like Oh yeah. Um I went to the grocery store today and I actually paid with my phone for the first time ever because I forgot that my phone has like the Google wallet thing on it. And How I was just thinking it went pretty good. It went smoother than I thought. I had no issues or whatever, but I was just thinking like, damn, what if I my phone died and I didn't have my wallet on me? Like I'd be I'd be screwed. So I think we are a little too reliant on cuz I've seen we a lot are. of a lot of people pay with their phones before. Yeah. yeah right. oh, I think I think it's I usually actually... have my Sorry, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Mike. Or go ahead, John. Are you... Okay. Um yeah. I know um I think it's just good to have cash with you at all times and to have like your cash or you have your um if you're or you have your credit cards with you your debit cards like if you don't if you're if you're gonna want to pay with your phone or something have those backups because i think it's good because like exactly like what if Mm -hmm. the debit machine isn't working or this and that like the other day i was at work and my mom came to my work and um she didn't bring her wallet or anything so she was gonna pay with her phone and her phone died so i had to to give her my debit card to pay yeah and um because she didn't have her wallet with her, because like, oh, I'll just pay with my phone. So I think it's good yeah. to have all those options, but you don't want to have one option that's too big to fail. Correct. And I was gonna say, you know, my 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 circumstance personally is the the opposite of that. I usually have my wallet with me, mm-hmm. um, and my phone. Like, yeah, I have my card on it, but that's like in case I forget my wallet, I can pay with my phone. The problem with that is not every place accepts tap pay. So Walmart doesn't and the local gas station doesn't. So like for those kinds of things, I have to – I, I, I kind of am just on like SOL. But I mean everywhere else that it accepts it, it's a good kind of emergency if I forget my wallet. Yeah. All right. And – uh one final thing, right, before we before we go off the AI stuff, fucking old people. I hate those old people on Facebook. Oh, my God. God bless. This picture is so beautiful of a kid with, like, Amen, a 50-foot brother. pizza. Get the fuck Amen. out of here with that bullshit, or, bro. Uh, or, or you have, like, a Jesus holding Donald yeah. Trump or something. You're like, God and bless this like, country and God bless Donald Trump. Or, <laughs> and it's, oh like, God, Obi-Wan Joe Kenobi. Biden. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Joe Biden I love said, those images. Joe Biden said skibbity toilet. Like, what does that mean? Um, son, what does uh, that what mean? Is that? What is this? Um, Jesus Christ gave birth to a life. litter of puppies. This is a miracle. God bless. Fuck right. off. These people, I, I have a conspiracy theory, uh, like Chris, what you were saying yesterday, or whatever day, yeah. it was dead internet theory. A lot yeah. of those people, I don't think they're real. And that's scary. I don't think so either, man. I think it's all bots. Or not all bots, but I think it's predominantly bots. And it's just in a feedback loop. Mm. But it could also very well be I AI know. generated Facebook pages. That's what I'm like saying. The AI, whole thing, AI you know, it's, so it's not really someone's grandpa. The, pages. the whole thing is uh, is fake. Sometimes oh, I yeah. think that, but then I, you know, then I see my mom and she's like, you know, like, oh, look at this. Like, mom, that's not real. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> Critical thinking is the key. Look, mom, I love you, but Jesus did not drive an F-250. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jesus, I, um, I, mom, did you see here that um, Joe Biden actually knew Jesus Christ? He was yeah. there in the Stone That's, Age. That is actually believable. He is old as fuck. I, I can see that. Uh, but, recently, no, somebody started. Recently, somebody started a thing on uh, on TikTok, and it's just like stuff that is younger than both Joe Biden and Donald Trump, who were both born in like 1940s, by the way. Um. And it's just like sliced bread, the motion picture, freaking television, the space <laughs> program. God damn. Dippin' dots, double-sided tape, like, 
Holy shit. VHS tapes. Like, that is insane. It's wild to me that the people that make the policies in our country are older than the invention of sliced bread. Like, when they were born... Hey, that was in, what, 1926? <laughs> ...cutting that shit themselves every day. It wasn't pre-sliced. Yeah. And now we segue into the second half of the podcast, which was brought up by Mike the other day when we were planning it, uh, societal burnouts. Why don't you kind of spearhead this uh, category, Mike? Absolutely. I'd love to. So societal burnout. Um, I think the way I described it to Dom the other day is we as a society have essentially, at least in my opinion, we've essentially hit this wall. So we spent millenniums, centuries, however long advancing our society, advancing technology, advancing how we live, advancing uh, medicine, advancing, you know, mo uh, uh, entertainment and art and all this other stuff. But we've come to a point where we can't really progress any further. We we don't we've hit sort of a wall, a, 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 a wall of of. Of progress, a, pro a progressive wall, and our avenues forward are few and narrowed. AI is obviously one of them, um, but you know, there's other like as far as energy goes, there's limited prospects there, and the avenues that are there are are fraught with potholes and problems. So we're left with this issue where we want as a society to do more and continue to progress and continue to push ourselves forward and reach for new uh, new goals but we don't have the money or we don't have the resources or we don't have the technology or or there's you know government standing in our way or there's you know ethical implications and you know and and moral groups and you know things like that so we we've created so we've now we're now with this left with this question of well what now what do we do now and we've created things like apps and dating apps and 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 social media and stuff like that to kind of distract ourselves from from realizing how limited our future prospects are and to kind of placate us and make us feel less i don't know like less shitty about the fact that we we were gifted kids who just have burned out oh yeah I feel like uh yeah. Oh, and, God, I'm sorry. And, 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 sorry, I was going to say, uh, and, and like a perfect example of this is, you know, there's an entire generation of people, 2.5, 3 million people that are depressed or, or just plain bored because yeah. with all of the world at their fingertips, with everything that's available, they just – they don't know where to go or what to do next. I wonder if it's a cultural thing. You know, when my parents were young, my dad was born in 1945, my mom was born in 55. And it was the age of, you know, grow up, they're boomers, you know, grow mm -hmm. up, get a job, and that's the job you have until the day you die. I think that's changed uh, for a lot of reasons. Contraction of the economy, depressed wages, the minimum wage hasn't been raised in something like 15 or 20 years. I just wonder if it's a gener if a generational or, or cultural shift. People start and stop judges now. There was this thing before and, and slightly after the pandemic, right? The quiet quitting. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, and and I think that that might be part of it. Um, you know, as as the generations have progressed on, the the focus of what's important in those generations has changed, has shifted. Um, it's not so much, you know, this is one job, work it until you die. It's this is one job, work it until it no longer can sustain you and then try to find something better or work it as long as you possibly can before it's closed now. Like that's, that's now the nowadays mentality. It's, it, and it's left us just, so empty as you a suppose, society you don't know what more to do mm -hmm. do you suppose the the corporate practice of planned obsolescence here uh has anything to do with this like you know your iphone is only going to last so long and Ooh, that's a good point the, the things you have are only going to last so long so give what you can out of them but it feels a little soulless to have to trade up like that with phones appliances careers yeah, because I'm pretty sure we've all heard our parents say, like, oh, they don't make that like they used to. 
um, whether it be TVs yeah. or phones. Like TVs used to be a huge, like three hundred pound piece of equipment. Now they're you know. They're I mean, really it was cheap. like a piece of furniture. Literally. Uh, cars yeah. are a perfect example. You know, they used to, yeah they used to guzzle gas like crazy, but they were made from like actual steel. You could hit right. a tree or you could hit another car, and the worst that happens was you scrape the paint. Nowadays, you hit a speed bump going too fast, and your entire fender exhaust and manifold yeah. are sitting 50 feet behind you. Like, everything's <laughs> gone from underneath your car. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Um, I had a family friend of ours recently. He got this, uh, he just retired and he got a new car, and it's like 75,000 or something. It's a really nice car. Oh, jeez. Yeah, <laughs> and um, uh, he, I was helping him get groceries out of his trunk. It's like this is like a few weeks ago, and uh, you know, with the newer models of cars and everything, they don't. It's like all buttonless, and it's like ooh, all tappy tappy shit. But anyway, I was trying to find the button to lift the trunk in the back. Seventy-five thousand dollar car, and I was moving the plastic with my hands. Like it just so fake. It's such a That's materialistic so thing, literally. And it's I like, wonder. oh god. No, I was agreeing with you. Go ahead. Oh, no. I it, wonder if. <laughs> international trade has much to do with this you know we to mike's point yeah we used to build it here and i don't want to go on a political screed but you know things used to be built in america mm -hmm. and they've been outsourced for the past 30 or 40 years and i don't think it's a secret that the quality's dipped that's where the whole made in china stereotype well i mean it's not really a stereotype but that's where we all have timu timu cars is, yeah because it is kind of accurate to a point where a lot of countries now like u.s canada stuff they're not building like in how like in the country like you're not building your cars you're not building your the the furniture you're not building your stuff in canada and the u.s and i think if 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 it was built more within your own like country i think maybe you'd get better products maybe you can get the cheaper products because think of it if you're getting all this stuff from china they have to ship it and they have to bring it across so then of course they're going to regulate their own prices and they're going to jack up prices and then this was the thing years ago good. yeah this was a thing years ago when they first debuted the prius they said the carbon footprint to create a prius is greater than the act than like a normal car wow yeah well that's that's another thing too like if you're talking about carbon footprint like you have a lot of politicians who complain about oh you know we gotta cut down gas and stuff but then yet they'll be the same people that will go and fly in their jets and waste and they'll be the ones that Taylor Swift. give a huge garbage. Yes, yeah. a very right. famous environmentalist has copies of her books in every bookstore. And I just wonder what the carbon footprint, how many trees had to die for Greta's book. Oh, yeah, you're not exactly. a, you're not a fan of her, Chris? Not really. Yeah, I don't I, I don't I, I, If you're an environmentalist, I, I would think you would go with a digital book, you know, save the trees. But Yeah, I don't know. And a lot of these environmentalists, they're just hypocrites. They're like, oh, yeah, we're going to go and save the planet. And then they'll go and fly on their jet and they'll waste a whole bunch that, of that's why I, fuel I, and they'll cut down trees and shit low-key i stopped yeah, listening to that they oh sorry mike uh just real quick i was gonna say like uh, sorry, on, on, the same, <laughs> on the same topic of what uh what he was just saying you know greenpeace saying that they're for protecting the oceans and stuff and then they may crash an oil tanker and spill thousands of gallons of crude oil there's a conspiracy theory out there that says Greenpeace is controlled up by the oil companies. I don't really? know if it's true or not, but I like to imagine it is mostly for fun. Yeah, I can what believe it. What you say, Don? Uh, I was just going to say that um, that's why I stopped listening to um, a lot of actors and Amen. activists. Because when I, I mean, I never really looked up to any growing up. Um, yeah. And I never really got my knowledge from them. But... You know, like back in 2013, 2014, uh, when Ellen did that Oscar selfie and it was like the most popular oh, thing on, on the internet at the time, I was like, oh man, you know, I, I love these guys. That's so funny. Like, retweet. That's so cool. Nowadays, I'm like, fuck all of you. <laughs> like, Wait, yeah, yeah, like, that photo specifically has not aged well. No, because like we half of them are creeps now. You have all these fuckers out the here and they're like, oh my god, like. We're starting a foundation to, you know... It's like uh, Oprah in The cutting, Rock. Cut. 
Cut, when, cutting trees. When the uh, Hawaii They're fires all trying happened. Trying to keep up with the OG guilt tripper Sarah McLaughlin. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Please protect the children of Africa. They're all yeah. dying of starvation. It's like you found the most impoverished village in that entire fucking country. Found the sickest looking children, stuck them in front of a camera, and and tried to profit off them. Is that I where that came from? Like, like kids dying in Africa? Yeah. Shoot that commercial, you could have given to those kids in food and probably solved the problem. Congratulations. A You're terrible. It was a thing back in the 80s, too. South Park used to make fun of it, like Sally Struthers. They're starving children in Africa. Mm-hmm. Like she was yeah. another one. I mean, yeah. I, mean, just like, I mean, technically, there, I mean, there is, like... There is, and, and I mean, don't get me wrong, right, but like, the, get this like, right, like, the, this. like the rich white liberal guilt complex in this country is ridiculous. I fucking hate but that shit. The, exactly, like raising money for these kids is great, but when the spokesperson could literally open their pay, their checkbook and solve the problem, mm-hmm. yeah, well, like, that's like, on the no, spot. Going back to what I was saying though, that's why I stopped listening to them because you have these Amen. fucking fake ass people like Oprah and The Rock. Who, when the oh, Hawaii like, fires happened, apology. when the Hawaii fires happened, um, yeah. the government only gave like the citizens of Hawaii five hundred bucks or like a thousand or something, barely any money to cover the costs of their destroyed homes and cars and whatnot. And then yeah. you have these two really rich celebrities, Oprah and The Rock, and they come to the American people who just survived the pandemic, just starting to get their jobs back and everything, if you can donate anything, why the fuck don't you donate something? Don't you have like 20 million fucking houses and cars? You can't donate like like, 10 million or something? 5 million? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking, and people are making memes of that. It's like you got these two all rich people being like, um, can you give some money for this? It's like, why don't you give on that, the money? Or why? On that yeah, why don't you help? Or like, why isn't the government doing anything? Why is the government giving all this money to Ukraine? Mm-hmm. And Israel, but not to their own state that's just been burned down. You were saying like this. Right now, there are something like three million Texans that are sitting in the dark, in the heat, after a hurricane. Greg Abbott is in Japan, and the federal government yeah. isn't batting an eye to even bother to help them. Because like, they're oh, more but, but concerned let's... about whether or not the president's cognitive effectiveness is on point. Why the hell is he or, in Japan? Uh, or... he, um... I don't know, because Greg Abbott's a scumbag. He's like Ted <laughs> yeah. Cruz. They take off right before the disaster happens and then don't do anything <laughs> to help their constituents. Hey, say, you what you, your... say what you want oh. about Chris Christie, but when Hurricane Sandy happened, he, he got his ass over here. Yeah, He did, he put, and he, he, and he rubber, called... And went down and started helping floodwaters. President Obama, President Obama came... Came down to meet Christie and Pete and Republicans criticize him, be like, "Oh, it's six days until the election. Why is he meeting with the president? Like, he's what do you want him to do?" <laughs> like, it's like, right, it was a fucking he's like, he's like he's doing his job, and the pre- and he was Obama was the president, not fucking Mitt Romney. So he's gonna get yeah. help from Obama. What were we gonna say? Chris? These, oh, I was gonna say, do you see these things at Walmart and like Speedway? I see them around here. And, you know, at the end of your transaction, it's like, do you want to donate a dollar for the Children's Hunger Fund? And I'm like, no, you want a corporate drawdown at the end of your tax season. Yeah, don't so they I save money on taxes by doing that? They sure do. Charitable donation. Like, we all have on our tax returns. Yeah, I'm just so like... that makes me a little crazy. <laughs> well, that's like, when I see that, I'm like, oh, donate $2. I'm like, yeah, that's, those $2 is not going anywhere to save right. starving children. I'm like, fuck that. There was a thing back during Katrina. Um, the Red Cross got horribly criticized you. for this. I don't know if you remember this because it's so long ago for some of us. Uh, the Red Cross got really criticized during Katrina because they weren't – a lot of their funding goes to overhead anyway. So like when you donate to Red Cross, you're really paying for someone's salary, which I'm not too keen on. The Red Cross probably has some good to it, but I would rather that money go to direct aid like into someone's pocket. One of our seasonal poll workers, on a side note, one of our, our colleagues in the office um, does side work for FEMA in the area and he does a lot of tornado assistance things like that and as I understand, in trouble too. yeah they did as i understand it, there's been some Anne reform Marie. since katrina but there are federal mandates to how much money they can give out and when and to whom which isn't how it should be um but that's been capped mm-hmm. over the years which is really sad I also, yeah i also feel like well, FEMA, in trouble 
sorry, I was going to say, FEMA also got in trouble after Hurricane Irene because they sent representatives yeah. out to talk to a bunch of different people in hard-hitting areas. And I remember they sent somebody to our house to take pictures of the hurricane damage, and then we just never heard anything from them ever again. And it was discovered that they sent these representatives out to take pictures of hurricane damage so they could send it to the government and say, hey, we've got all this damage. We need money. But then the money that was given was basically just to cover the overhead and and was never actually given to anybody that was affected. That's a shame. That's a real shame. As I've gotten older, yeah, I'm yeah. starting to dislike the government more and more. But I feel like that's part of the core foundation of being American. Um, yeah. Is like being anti-government. If you like your government, I think you're doing it wrong. It should always be held to account. Yeah, wasn't that the whole really thing? I think it's the whole thing of it seems as being mm. American, like from because like who's not growing American. up, I've realized or I initially thought that like oh, more tax is good, you know, put it to better programs and stuff, and more government, you know, the government can be here to help us out. And but as I've gotten older, it's like they don't do any of that shit, and it's really like disheartening because you you want to. I mean, at least in my experience, I want to be um, proud to be American, and I want to be like America, fuck yeah. But then. You know, you just see all the poor choices. Then reality made. hits. Yeah, and it's just like, yeah. what's the point? And that I think kind of going back me to the burnout. Yeah, exactly. Me I was just going to say I'm that. I'm in this kind of weird limbo state where it's like, on the one hand, I don't like our government, and it definitely needs to be changed and overhauled, but what are we going to install that's better? Because right. in the end, it's still going to be a bunch of people, and they're never going to agree 100%. And before too long, it's going to be the same thing that it is now. People trying to get back at each other in petty, spiteful ways in spite of the people that put them there. Mm -hmm. Real problems. You're right. I agree with you, Mike. I feel like So, I mean, how do we create something better than what we have without creating what we have all over again? I feel like a complete rework or remodel of the government the three branches of government, and I feel like we should abolish the two-party system. Not saying, like, in favor of a one-party system, but, like, right. instead of Republican-Democrat, just, like... Because I feel like Three there's a parties, lot... I think. Not just that, I kind of like... I feel... I kind of like the Roman Forum, uh, where it was... You had heads of state that all got together, and they openly discussed problems everybody got a chance to speak everybody heard what everybody had to say and in the end majority vote won but there was no parties there was no like definitive i am this or i am this it mm -hmm. was everybody was there under the representation of their people in their state yeah i can tell and, you uh, just to finish what i was saying the um We've be we've grown too accustomed, and we have like this parasocial relationship with the terms Republican, Democrat, or you know labels mm -hmm. and everything. And Liberal, I feel conservative. what we our real issues at hand. What? How do I word this? What divides We're so us? tribal that yeah. real problems get sidelined. Precisely. What divides us could unite us more than uh, I. I could re word it so much better, but. It's more of a class war than a, you know. I would agree. The the rich people in this country are always going to protect their wealth first. And mm -hmm. the minute it looks in, in any way encroached upon, they're going to circle the wagons and defend themselves. We see it with journalists, with rich people. Um, I mean, people got after Gal Gadot for singing on Zoom during the pandemic. And everybody else was like, oh, come on. She's doing a good thing. Like, <laughs> it's mostly a thing. It's kind of um, cringe. Yeah, as to the two-party thing, strange. I can tell you that the major two parties have and and they're both guilty of it have engineered things in such a way that letting in minor parties, any other kind of party, is going to be exceptionally difficult. Oh yeah, because there are rules with think... things like if you're a libertarian, you have to have more signatures on a petition, things like that. So they've I... gamed it pretty expertly. And I think it comes a, comes a little bit out of fear because yeah, absolutely. they've been around for so long and they have this love-hate relationship with the public that if they let in another party that could you know, just as easily get votes as they do without all the restrictions, they could possibly lose. Right. And, that, and now they're down with everybody else in the mud. 
They're not right. up on their pedestals. Chris and or Sean no dignity in the wilderness. Might what? be able to answer this question. When was the last time we had an independent president or anything that wasn't Republican or Democrat? Like probably the 1800s. Ross Perot. Ross yeah. Perot in the 90s. 1890s? Well, he wasn't president. He wasn't, he wasn't president. a president. He was a candidate. He ran in 92. Yeah, he's, he he's, saying, in... he's saying uh, president because... Um, oh, I mean, not I know, in this century. Oh, definitely not. I know. I know. No. Uh, in the United States, because um, the old what was it? The Whig Party. They were kind of like almost like what the Republican Party became. Yeah, uh, like there's the been a million are kind of like was what the there, Democrats are. Was there ever an independent? But, well, the only independent. The only independent like, president ever was George Washington. Right. That was the Christ. first fucking president. So oh, yeah, not yeah. long ago. Just you know, the 1700s. <laughs> Yeah, and like even Thomas, like Thomas Jefferson was a Democrat Republican, which that's what they used to call them before well, they established the Democratic Party. Which I want to point Jackson. something out about that. Mm -hmm. There's been about 500 million political realignments in the country since Jefferson, so I think it would be a misnomer to to say he was a Democrat or Republican. That's oh, what I see too know. about it's, a lot of Republicans. I think Jefferson like, may have been the last independent president before they actually started in with like real parties to be honest yeah. jackson's andrew jackson started the democratic party but see that's the thing like modern day republicans are always like oh well the democrats created the kkk and you know they were for slavery but like chris said there's been so many different realignments that like it a has, lot of has. old democrats aren't really democrats of today and vice versa yeah it's true oh, yeah. even the old even the democratic the democratic party of Fucking JFK is not the Democratic Party of today, and the Republican You're Party. Absolutely of, right. Even even Can Ronald we talk Ray about the fact that the Robert F. Kennedy is still in the race? Props yeah, to him, and, to be fair. It props like, to be honest. I I, I think if I south. I think sorry, if I was an <laughs> sorry, I, I think if I was an American and I was voting, I probably would vote for RFK Jr. I don't like some of his points. Like I don't like his stuff on like vaccines it's a little bit stupid but i think out of the other, all those three options he's the best and plus i've always considered myself to be a very kennedy style democrat so. yeah i'm honestly with you like as an american with the other two just being so toxically volatile towards one another and not really even paying much attention to the election because they've basically already got the the nominations like they didn't have to work for anything I, i'm starting to think that i might just vote for RFK. I mean, like he, he, even if he doesn't win, it's not the other two. Yeah, I don't I, agree with everything he says, but it's it's still plus better. He's than constantly you. there. Like he he works out. Like he's really in good shape for his age. Mm. Um, the only thing know, is his uh, voice, but he had like a, he has a, a disease or something, right? It's yeah. like a neurological yeah. disease. That, uh, yeah, but, but even then, like props to him for that's actually. They found out more common in Americans than than previously thought. Christ, what are we gonna I say? Yes. It, oh, I it, just, sometimes I wonder if uh, we'd be better off with like a British parliamentary system. But then I worry somebody would call an election every week over something <laughs> invented problem. Yeah. The thing is with a British parliament. Well, the thing is with even with that, because obviously living in Canada, we have that sim system. Because yeah. they were trying to implant that to get rid of Trudeau. But you do need like votes for that. Like everyone has to kind of agree right. And so the other part of this election. is, I, I I don't think there's any political will to do that. Yeah. Yeah, because Americans it's, are very lazy. They like to complain than actually do something. Yeah, they like well, to Canada, complain and then do Canada's nothing. the same way. <laughs> Canada, we complain about like oh Trudeau and everything, which I think he's going to lose the next election. I hope so. Um, but you guys have term limits up there. Uh, we do. Uh, actually, no, we don't have term limits. No, you can. Interesting. Fucking, okay. Somehow I thought you did. Elected. She was oh, an cool. no. like, uh, It's like our Congress, so we just don't have term limits for them. Yeah, which is also which is dumb insane. You got you got fucking ninety year olds as senators in the U.S. Um, but the Supreme Court <laughs> life appointments. Bread. <laughs> yeah. But they take just, it up with the founding fathers. But it's just I don't know. Like I mean, I, just I think. Um, fuck! I forget where I was going with this. In Honestly, short, the founding but, fathers kind of fucked us over, Loki. True, but yeah, the founding fathers you know, the world also... in 1776 was not the world that we have now. So that's the thing. Do you guys think that the founding fathers could have even comprehended how far we no, advanced? No, not at all. Not at all. No. So and could I you think really the founding blame fathers? 
I think the founding right. fathers would be shocked at a number of things. Most actually, the Catholic on the Supreme Court. Because, I mean, try to think of it from our was not a thing in their time. current day perspective. Right. Like, let's say we get, like, nuke guns one day. Or, like, yeah. orbital cannons from outer space that we can blow our neighbor's house up. Like, right now, we could probably barely comprehend that and the legal implications. But then you just know they're going to say, right. oh, well, our Second Amendment says we can have orbital cannons. Right. It's just, My constitutional think... right to the Death Star. <laughs> yeah. I just don't think that when they created that, because I didn't think that. Because, like, when 1776, it was kind of a law of the land for people to have guns because it was a different kind of world sure. that they were living in. I need in. this and... needler. In order to protect against terrorism, and like they, and I don't know, like I don't. The founding fathers, I think a lot of this stuff the founding fathers put, like people tend to manipulate. Like you even have the conservatives being like, "Oh, the church, the separation of church and state is actually to protect the church from the government." But it's like, no. If you look at the founding fathers, like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, they around. were very against organized religion. Like Thomas Jefferson even yeah. spoke against Christianity and all of that. It was to protect. It was to prevent like any kind of religion not just christianity but any religion from dominating the government and jefferson even once um said that the constitution should have been redone every 19 years that's so what I where did that. these so chris you probably know this where did all these christian people come from saying like one nation under god and doesn't that kind of conflict. like contradict itself when they're saying that yeah, yeah. so so in my opinion as a history degree and, and having my political opinions that I do also. I am not in favor of any of that. I think it's a violation of the Establishment Clause. The church and state are separate. They should be. Yeah. Um, like, I don't even like the fact that we say under God during the Pledge of Allegiance. I got weird opinions on that, too. I'm weird. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, as to no, the so-called... I'm with you. I personally don't say the pledge. I... Yeah. I think it's weird to pledge... Anyway... As to the, the kind of genesis of the religious right, as near as I can tell, it comes about in the 60s when there's a political realignment that had to do with a lot with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. A lot of Southern Democrats uh, who, who are now Republicans, so it shifted, right? This is why the South always goes to the Republicans now. It wasn't always that way. In 68, and, right, in 68 and 72, that changes mostly because Southern Democrats are pissed off about the Civil Rights Act. And it comes out of the silent majority that Nixon has. People who were pissed off about the Voting Rights Act, pissed off about the student protesters, pissed off about Vietnam. And it finds its greatest expression in Ronald Reagan, where the religious right realizes this is... And he courts them over a series of years when he's California governor, and he realizes that this is a path to political power. Mm -hmm. And we're still living with that. Reagan, I think, is the most influential uh, modern-day, quote-unquote, uh, politician. Good or bad, like, yes. Yeah, because he's, um, I would say more on the bad side. Like he was very charismatic and everything, but it seems like like the whole what was it trickle down economics? Some good, some yeah. You're talking yeah. about supply side economics, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of it I, is still felt today, and I feel like it's just kind of snowballed. Wasn't yeah. Ronald Reagan in the movies prior to being oh, yeah. president? Mm -hmm. He was. He was. You know, it was in Back to the Future, right? The actor Ronald Reagan, yeah. So, yeah, he's a, he was an actor. He was an actor in the 40s and 50s, and then he yeah. they even decided he used to be a Democrat too. He, he did, work. and then he and broke with him over communism, and because yeah. it was all the thing, and he became a Republican. He was governor of and California then he ran twice. For governor, they mentioned him governor. in Watchmen too. We yeah. keep talking about so Watchmen it, this week. I think it's a sign to, to watch the movie or read the book. Yeah, <laughs> in the movie so. they make I, it. Oh, yeah, wasn't it in the movie? That in the movie, movie. wasn't at the end of the movie. It's like yeah, in the movie. And, they make and, it Reagan. He becomes president in the movie. In the comic, the, in it's the Robert Redford. Movie. Interesting. Because it's at the end. Because Nixon's president during the during the uh, movie. Right. Because he's, he wins like a third term during the movie. And then at the end of the movie, Ronald, everyone's like, Ronald Reagan's considering running for president. We can't and have the like, cowboy the in office. All right. I'm looking at my copy of Watchmen now. I mean, yeah. you have to. One thing you have to give him credit for is like people didn't think so he was much. gonna win because he was just. They, people were like, "Oh, he's a crazy cowboy from California. How is he gonna be president?" And the Russians and he, were terrified of him, which is a, a lot of fun to read about. And he and he made really good friends with Gorbachev. Like they were yeah. friends, and they were completely. He different. actually bridged a huge gap uh, in the Cold War between Russia and the U.S. and it's, was instrumental in the Berlin Wall coming down. It's interesting yeah. to say that because of... Famous, famous for saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. 
Yeah, it's and interesting you I, say that. I think their friendship kind of helped that because Gorbachev really respected Reagan. Reagan respected but what's, him. What's also interesting is with the with the allization or or at least the 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 peaceful understanding, I'll say, between the U.S. and Russia, it led to an increase in gang crime. It led to an increase in drug crime. It led to an increase in uh in illegal immigration at the time so it was weird it was like we we strengthened uh we strengthened foreign relations but at the same time domestically we started facing a whole slew of new problems yes has a very weird history you were saying chris really I'm sorry. oh no it, uh, i recently read a book it was called the human factor and it's about reagan and gorbachev and thatcher and those kind of personalities and how they came together and and unwittingly to them helped bring about the end of the Cold War. Something that uh, I, I think none of them intended to happen. I think Gorbachev just wanted communism with a friendly face. Mm. And unfortunately, some West German or some East German guard misread a note in 1989 and started border crossings, and then the whole thing came down. Christ. But I can recommend yeah. that book very good. Sounds interesting. I know, because Chris, you're a Thatcher you like Thatcher? Yeah, it's very strange because I'm a I'm kind of a crazy liberal, but I, I really like and admire her. I still can't figure it out myself. And you like Nixon too? And Nixon's I do, and I do. I think Nixon is a different kind of conservative than we have today. I mean, Nixon founded the EPA, ended the draft, ended the war in Vietnam. Uh, That's very true. strange, very you know, un unusual moves from a from a he conservative. He is literally He's also Alexander the only Scott. To ever uh, be president in the future? That's I right. think Nixon is actually very un like, like okay. There's a lot of shit. Like I think Watergate is actually the least of his like. I think of his shit if, because Watergate is like, like what what politician didn't spy on their fucking. Here's the th oh, well, you um, raise a good point. Um, Nixon and and Johnson were tapping each other's phones, and the only reason Johnson didn't go after him for it because it was illegal at the time is because Johnson was tapping his phone. Well, so, Johnson was tapping uh, everybody. Uh, Barry, Barry in Barry in Goldwater. Barry yeah. Goldwater. So, like, so, I just don't think that was even the worst of his like. Crimes. No, no, I think and I, and I think Polonia is a bigger crime. I think people he, blow Watergate out of proportion. I really do because, like, yeah, Nixon was it, on yeah. track to win the election anyway. McGovern had issue anyway, and I he think had a it's big such, hand in Vietnam too. Like, let's right, not I think forget that. I think so it's like, such a small part of his legacy. I mean, he, the old Vulcan proverb, I right? I kind of do like Nixon to a point. Like I, Nixon I, is interesting, and I, I would hope that his legacy is, is judged less on Watergate and more on the international stuff, ending the draft, yeah. ending the war, the EPA, going to China. Yeah, I mean, if you want to criticize him, it'd be more on, it'd be more on the mass bombings in Vietnam and also the illegal... Um, yes, the wiretapping and, and bombing F Cambodia is not so good yeah. either. Like that, I would say is more of a fair criticism. Like Watergate's, like okay, every politician does it. This shit. Right, you know, we're I mean, still it's, doing it's, that. Like, it's kind of like wrestling with a pig. Being in politics, you expect the dirty. I, I feel like we've gotten off track from Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me look at the notes here. Uh, I can't even remember how we started this tangent <laughs> we started on societal burnout and then ended up talking about bombing cambodia oh yeah <laughs> yeah that that sounds about right yes <laughs> well you know and then you know obama goes and drone sticks okay anyway um I, to, to I, I think the societal burnout um i was thinking about the drive home tonight and i thought of oppenheimer which i don't know if you guys have seen I have. Lewis, I Lewis Straws in there, you know, I read a review once that said he's a public servant and he gets lost in service so much that it turns sinister for him. And I think maybe part of, at least in my job and my situation, of course it's different for everybody, what can keep the societal burnout out is finding little things, maybe not ways to serve exactly, but, you know, you find your joy. Oh, yeah. yeah, you got to find something that makes you happy. Yeah. Um, but as a society, I think we need to find a way to progress ourselves forward. Not, yes. ne not necessarily just kind of like distract ourselves, you know, in the meantime. I think there's a lot of that. Already. Actually give more into developing the future and building a future. 
Right. Yeah. As they, um, like, with, the way I see it. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, the way I see it, where we're heading now, we don't really have much of a future. Like, this is I agree. it. And whatever comes next is going to be pebbles in comparison. We've peaked. I think a lot of. Oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, we've kind of peaked as a society, but not necessarily in a good way. Like, a hundred years ago, the entire world was so different technology wise, and then, um, you know, like knowledge yeah. wise as well, because we, a hundred years ago, we weren't even in space yet, and we've done a lot. But at the same time, from a, you know, that's more of a human achievement kind of thing that we all share, but on a personal level, kind of like what, what Mike was saying, that we're very kind of stuck in an endless loop. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it's hard to imagine a future because wages are depressed. People have no mobility. Mm -hmm. And and it's a dark future. I'll kinda, be right honest with you. Going back to the AI stuff, um, we have AI and robots and everything taking jobs. And then we have, you know, we're, we're kind of promoting to a lot of the younger kids as well, uh, virtual reality. And you see like the MetaQuest or whatever it's called and then the Apple Vision Pro thing. You know, we're like, oh, meet with your friends. Like, you know, it, and I'm not even saying, you know, long distance friends from across the world or whatever, but, you know, people that you might go to school with or, you know, that you might know in real life. You know, like we have so many fun chat rooms and, you know, you could you could go out and have a walk in the park in the in the MetaQuest. And it's we so had those fucking, in the 90s, too. Yeah, it's so fucking corny. Like go outside you ever hear of the meme touch grass like literally go outside you can go in a have forests and and walk you can go hang out with your friends and stuff. yeah you can literally yeah. do that stuff in real I think life so lazy and they're just like oh i'm too scared to go and that outside. and that is where i say we have reached a societal burnout we, we when don't know what in the to do next, mm -hmm. and we aren't sure where to go next, so we're just distracting ourselves and killing time, because what else is there? And we're giving us stuff to do, and um, or rather we're giving AI stuff to do, instead of, oh, I don't know, uh, picking up a guitar or picking up a pen or picking up a camera and actually making this the art that you want to see. You raise an excellent point. Mm -hmm. You know, I can make an AI image of Superman or I could spend the years going to school to learn to become an artist. And it's like you said earlier, it's the quick and easy path. And the thing is, ooh, this is, this is a good analogy right here. When yeah. you go to a grocery store and you see like a pre-prepped meal you know that's great and all but like let's say you were to go have a date over and you know you have him or her at the table and you're like you slap that bitch on the table you know like all right here you go this is this is a nice gourmet meal what would be more rewarding like if you actually took the time to make the meal or if you just like pre-ordered it and then you know just slap it on yeah, the table put like it in the microwave a for a few minutes and yeah yeah it's so, a tough yeah, i just call. think it's it's a cheat mm. and it's just laziness and it's just not as it isn't as rewarding because if you can just go and there's a grab a you know a microwave meal i, I i'm one of those people that doesn't even eat that kind of stuff mm -hmm. i avoid for it plus processed and just not yeah vegetarian yeah we get it guy yeah, but no, but it's just not even good for you in general. And also just, like, it's it's late. Like, I just feel like it's cheating. Yeah. You know? There's a lot of value in creating, and that ranges from art to relationships to food, like you say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I just and worry that we're so driven by a consumerist culture that it's going to be hard to break out of that. I'm not we one have to, to encourage people to create. We have to mm -hmm. support creativity. Absolutely. Um, Unfortunately, and the they always cut the arts think, first. <laughs> exactly. I was about to say, like, I think one of the things our government needs to do or like, you know, we, we need to do as a society more is support things like the arts and like sciences yeah. and stuff. Anything that challenges the mind, challenges the viewpoint, the status quo and makes you think critically and logically about stuff. Yeah. You know, it, that's how we're going to that's how we're going to do. more. That's how we go forward. Um I'm not one to boast, and you'll rarely hear me trying to sound conceited or whatever, but one thing that hey, I... Hey, if, if you don't toot your horn, who else will, Dom? Literally. 
one thing I will boast about is my uh, imagination and creativity. And, you know, I have so many different ideas and thoughts all the time. I think that's why I get, uh, again, burnout, uh, because I'm just trying to, I don't know, has like that creative artist passion within me, like, oh, I got to get this stuff out. You know, I got to have this be seen. Right. But, you know. You have what like a good burnout it's you have so much creativity and so much going on in your head that you don't know where to start mm -hmm. and so it's, you 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 push yourself to do a bunch of stuff and then you kind of run into a roadblock because you're out of steam from doing so much literally and that's what it's heartbreaking because you have these people who are this newer generation that oh let me go on chat gpt and, and write this script or let me you know make quote unquote artwork and sell it on etsy for 10 bucks when it's literally stuff you just wrote in you know prompts for an ai machine um it's really disheartening that is all that's that. on etsy now it's kind of sad i know and you see a lot of like cheap books on amazon and whatnot that have ai um photos and like yeah oh, you did not make this right I was disappointed. I have personal experience with this. I recently bought uh, a Hemingway book. Uh, it was a half price books and it was like four books in one. And you could tell like an AI compiled the whole thing from a publisher that didn't have the rights because half of those books aren't in the public domain yet. So oh, it's man. just heartbreaking to see such lazy commodification. Yeah. I think yes. what you guys were saying about, like we need to push that creativity because if we don't have creativity as a society or as a, a species, then, you know, if we let robots and everything do it for us, then what do we have to contribute to the world if that's exactly I mean, like doing everything we are we're with AI doing everything for us. We don't necessarily need to have that creativity. So we're just sitting here kind of bored. Like what now? What do we do? You know, what What do we do that they can't do for us? Mm. Go, got to help the company make another, uh, you know, million dollars this year. You know, it's my only contribution to the world. Like, there's so much more that you can do as a human being. And, you know, like, you can have a family and you can you do stuff. But I feel like art is the one thing that's kind of timeless in a sense, other than family. Sure. Cause and you it's can, always personal. Oh, yeah. It's subjective. And you can always put your heart and soul into it and then... When you have the other stuff, there is no heart and soul. So there's a big right. difference. That's you why I personally tried to go. Control. I was just gonna say that's why I personally tried to go, like when I'm on vacation stuff, to museums or to exhibits or you know things like that, where where people have obviously put in the time and the effort and the creativity to create something, and it's on display for everybody to see. Because a lot of the a lot of those places, like yeah, even if there's a charge to get into it, the money is going to keeping those institutions open and to encouraging others. Like, look at this, look at this sculpture, look at this painting. It looks like just an amalgamation of color and lines and garbage, but it's hanging here in this prestigious gallery, and somebody would pay sixty million dollars to own it and have it in their house, hands down. They Absolutely. can't because it's not for sale and will never be for sale mm -hmm. but if it ever were for sale they would pay any number of money and it encourages people like you could do this and it doesn't have to be like you don't even have to think it's good other people will think it's good you just have to try yeah you're always your own worst critic it's true they yeah, say that with writing uh, the hardest part true. is the blank page and and I learned this in, in writing classes in college. You know, the hard part is starting. And once you go, just go. That's what editing's for. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, people have recommended to me to try and, you know, do stand-up and stuff. But my biggest problem is that I, I can't write anything as far as, like actual stand-up to go off of because everything that i write when i when i perform it or i read it back it just seems so boring and like uninteresting like unfunny not anything i would want to even hear i feel like you'd be better off as improv like no plan yeah. exactly because you're yeah, like you're the... so fucking funny like, especially when you're exp like explaining um stuff going on at work i remember that fallout 76 video i did like, like a year ago you were complaining about this one lady and you were like just raging and it was so funny so i think, yeah, I think you, you, you work best 
off the top of your head. You should do yeah. improv. You should do improv. Yeah, just go, uh, you know. And there's a lot of power in that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Not everybody could do that, so that's good. The other thing is, especially with creation, they say, you know, if you can't do it for everyone, do it for one person, which is you. Do the kind of comedy that you want to, you know. Mm -hmm. So at least you get satisfaction out of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the thing is with comedy, too, like, not your comedy not, might not be everybody's uh, cup of tea. Like, so a lot of comedians are kind of you know, like they insult people in the audience and stuff. Like I personally don't like that, but it seems like a lot of people do. Thank you. Me either. I don't like that. No. I don't like a yeah. George Carlin or a Mulaney type. It's funny. I kind of do kind of laugh when, when comedians pick on people in the audience. But see, the, see the, I like George a... Carlin personally because he never picks on anybody specifically. It's Carlin always punched up, which I appreciate a bunch of people. I grew up watching Carlin. I absolutely love yeah. his work. Carlin always punched up. You know, he's not making fun of starving children in orphanages. He's making fun of people with power who deserve it. Yeah, exactly. You know, or or he's he's doing dark humor, but it's in a tasteful way. Right. right. He really helped me last year when I was having that like identity crisis. Like, oh my god, I don't know who like who or what I belong to, or you know, religious or political faction, and it's just like. George Garland kind of okay, helped me realize. All garbage. Yeah, they, they all suck. Yeah. Like it's a whole big. You're, you're joke. you, man, and you're yeah. the best. You. George, uh, what's his name? That's the Carlin. Carlin he's the comedian. Did he? Did he, did he die? He died. Yeah, he oh, years away. ago. He's been dead for like oh, twenty yeah, years. years ago. Mm -hmm. he had uh, yeah. cancer, I believe. Yeah. yeah. He was. He is funny. He is funny because he, he. He like he just believe it or everyone. not. When he first started out, he started out on a variety show, uh, doing a bit called the Hippy Dippy Weatherman. Was he and on a he Smothers Brothers suit with a crew cut and everything, and yeah. he just talked in this kind of hippie voice, reading the weather, and people thought he was funny enough to do stand up on his own. And and even the host of the of the variety show, uh, Jimmy Jimmy Carson, he he encouraged him. He's like, "Go, George, do it." And so when he got out and started doing Carson stand up specials on his own, he that's when he really let loose and was like, "Hey." Aside from this hippy dippy voice, you know what bugs the shit out of me? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Just like me, for real, for real. And then, of course, he had the seven dirty words, which was a televised a game with, changer. Were, I love, I love this story. They were televising his stand up, and they were not informed ahead of time of this bit. And he did it, and it was on live TV, and it was in front of all a live audience and all these people saw it and the tv station could not cut it fast enough and yeah. he said because as soon as he said and the seven words are and boom they rattled out of his mouth and they could not <laughs> cut the program fast enough <laughs> and he <laughs> said on air live in front of america oh, it again? seven words you can't say on tv this is going to be recorded for youtube so i won't say them at the risk of demonetization Man, fuck that. But I don't Google get shit it. from YouTube. <laughs> no, let's, just say, let's just say it. Let's say There's what are those words again? Uh, hang on. Let me bring them up. As long as there's nothing racial or discriminatory, we're good. No. Oh, no. It's shit, piss, fuck, cunt, cocksucker, motherfucker, tits. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> okay, then. He had it, he had it ready. It? And the best part, that's how George Carlin delivered that line, too. <laughs> just so seamlessly, so flawlessly. They're, they're, just, they're just seven words. Here's seven words. Boom. Did they end up cutting it or no? Because he said it that quick. I I don't. I think they. I think there was a moment where they they paused, but it it proceeded. Like I, I think the cameras cut, but the recording continued because there's a record. It, it is recorded on record on a record. Uh huh. So I, I want to say that I, I want to say that they continued, but he said them in such quick succession that like it made the TV studios panic. And from that day forward, they were very, very keen and very cautious about what they aired of George Carlin. What a legend! I know George Carlin. One of his like big things was when he said, um, "It's one big club, and you ain't a part of it." Or you yeah. ain't in it. It's you a ain't big in club, it. and you it's ain't in it. Well, I don't really subscribe it's to any conveniently also the faction. same big club they used to beat you over the head with. Sure. You know, this is, to your earlier point, Dom, this is kind of why I'm a, I'm a Thatcherite, or I would say, uh, which is at odds with most of my other liberal uh, opinions because I, I admire it. You know, I admire the work ethic and what she was about. Yeah. And I think it's important to have, how do I say this, kind of two thoughts at the same time. It thinks I think it helps keep us sharp. 
because then we think about what we think about and you have you to have defend to, it. You have to look at life from right. It would be a mistake to just subscribe to one school. Exactly. You gotta look at you all know, the uh, different. Try to if put yourself into the other, the other side mystery. of the coin. That's right. So to speak. And you don't want to follow something blindly like, oh, I pledge allegiance to America, but I'm not going to question right. authority or anything. Like, you have to always right. be on your toes kind of thing. You, you, know, you always have to question authority. authority. If you That's don't question authority, authority, you'll. If you don't, if you don't question everything, then you'll you're fall letting, for anything. Then you're just a robot. Right. That's what I said at the beginning, especially this government in this country. Sean, you're a little different up there, but probably the same. You know, it's it's the government. It deserves scrutiny. Yeah. Oh, no, it's the same. It's the same. I think no matter where you are, the government should be. Right. The government should, I, I believe it's almost the, the only power we have left. Should work. I believe it was like the, the founding fathers uh, in, and George Washington specifically who said that it's the a will of the American people to question yeah. their government and keep them honest and true. Right. It is. It so, is. I mean, like, if we don't question our government and, you know, say, hey, why is it that all this shitty stuff is happening, but you guys seem to be profiting off of it, you know, where is that right and how does that benefit us? They'll, that's they'll what, keep doing it. That's what pisses me off, too, because, like, we started off as a nation following those set of ideals, and now we have... A nation that we're too busy bickering with each other that we're not realizing that these people in power are the ones screwing us over with inflation yep. and everything I mean, and for, it's and it's so sake, hard to we'll, live and they're getting away with it it's while it's like oh Biden you know republicans or democrats it's, even, no it's like it's a deeper issue the two mm -hmm. big name ones like Sen uh, here, here's one, Senator Bob Mendez. He's currently under investigation for taking bribes in the way of gold bars. Oh, something yeah. Something that, that is easily spent in every country, including ones that we aren't allies with, oh, like, around the, the globe. what the fuck? And he's, he's totally my yeah, senator. Like, he's literally my make senator. Make I've heard about that shit. And it's like, what the yeah. fuck is he, your problem? Is he searched, he he searched a suit jacket and found $100,000 in a suit jacket. That's how you know these people are fucking scumbags. Because, like, it should be a, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And, you know, we, we keep electing them. Because, like we I said should, earlier, we, we like to complain more than actually do something about it. Absolutely. You know what I, what, I saw mm -hmm. this video and I was talking about, like, the 2020 election and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it goes even to the 2024 election because you guys have the same people. It's like it shouldn't be the lesser of two evils. It should be the greater of two goods you know mm -hmm. like it shouldn't i don't know i just think it's just yeah like the go i think the government should be fearful that people like i think the people should like if the government is really messing up and the people should be able to have their day to get the government now that's all it is in like south korea south korea is like a real democracy because they didn't like their president like it was a lady because she was doing some shit they went and protest oh, I remember the streets that. and she was out in like a few days yeah, she, she for, for yeah. what we would call probably she, a small infraction. Because we, they're, they're if we tried that, they would call in the National Guard. Yeah, I feel yeah. like power to the people, you know, we should go out hitting the streets, not like, and I, and, you know, not any violence honestly, or no, anything. Yeah. Not January 6th. Like that, no, that yeah, yeah. Let's, let's admit, like that is not, that is not protesting the government. That is blatant violation of what our core institution stands for that yeah. is we can't accept a democratic decision of our peers mm -hmm. and would rather follow the maniacal ravings of a lunatic and liar over over our fellow americans who we claim to be patriots and standing up for and how are you going to hang your own vice president like what was that news for and it's like hey oh, yeah. mike pence hey mike pence and it's which side are you on it's funny because I love when you have conservatives who will be like, Mike Pence is a rhino or this and that, but Mike Pence is more conservative than Donald Trump. Yes. Donald Trump in many aspects is actually very liberal. If you look at his, like, platform, he's People spent most of like his life opinion, because he's a Democrat. Like, outspoken. I don't like Mike Pence because of a lot of his policies and, like, his, his, his opinions on stuff. But, honestly, I still like him more than Trump because at the end of the day, he did his job. He did what yeah, he was. I think Mike Pence is actually a good man. Like, I think deep he down followed he's the rules. A good person, I think he's he's a good person. I don't like his like I politically I disagree with him, but I think he's 
a good person. I think he actually follows the Constitution because Trump. I think, is, yeah, I think politically, Trump just wants to play he, Trump. He's bankrupt, yeah. but at the same time, he's not yeah. the worst person in the world. Like, I wouldn't invite him to dinner, but I also wouldn't slap him in the face. You know, like. This is what they used to call a conviction politician. He has the courage of his beliefs, even if they're out there. That is yeah, true. Exactly. Like, and you got people like, oh, you know, he's a, he's actually like anything against Trump is just liberalism. It's like no, like if anything, Trump is more on the liberal side. It's called of, being of a and not being brainwashed. Yeah. It's like, fuck off. I think maybe the root here to bring it back is, you know, think critically. And I worry about this with our older population who sees everything on Facebook and just takes it in. Um, mm -hmm. Facebook well, yeah, specifically, which is kind of yeah. its own argument. You think like I, I'm not asking you to be suspicious or a conspiracy theorist, but just you know, be critical and say, mm, is this really on the up and up, or is this really? It's not difficult. No, you, just, have, you should question what Dom everything. Said. You should question no matter where it's coming from, and you should. Right. And the, the like, automatic, like, praise Jesus, like, like it, it feels so, not just fake, but it like, feels yeah, it, it feels, feels like forced. I mean, you you yes. put your... To play a little bit on what Dom said earlier, we have essentially a modern day library of Alexandria at, the, at our fingertips at any given time. It takes less time to do your own research and to fact check what you're reading than it does to post it. Right. Or to, to comment on it and say that somebody is wrong. Like, it, like you can easily check it up and see whether or not they're right or wrong. But then right. for like but the third or fourth that. time, facts, we facts. Americans like to complain more than actually do something. Absolutely. I, I, I used to date like somebody like that, Dom. Oh, really? I had, I had plenty of opinions, but I asked her, I said, are you registered to vote? And she said, no, I think it's all corrupt. And I was like, oh, looking back, that should have been a red flag. <laughs> But hey, I'm I trying to get registered, but I can't. I think What's going on there? You got an address the change? The problem with fact-checking, too, is... Um, I think, I, think I know what you're going to say, fact, Sean. No, because fact-checking can be, like, things that... It can be can loaded. Be really, it, can be subje it can be subjective, and it can be manipulated to one side. So sometimes it's hard Correct. to... Correct. Well, you know... And it this kind of brings this. it... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was saying, like, in just... It says right here, like, it's, I mean, if this is the side that, you know, like, oh, Democrats support this, so it's accurate, but it's, like, it's Yeah, and I mean, bias. Circling, back to, circling back to AI a little bit, like, this is what I was talking about with with AI not having a differentiation algorithm. That's what I, that's what I was trying to think of earlier. Differentiation algorithm. It is a series of, of code that tells the AI, it helps the AI to determine what is and is not fake news and what is and is not misunderstood. Mis you know, it, it, it allows the AI to think more critically and, 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 and be more accurate with the information it's giving. And a lot of modern AI doesn't have anything like that. So it's taking these these posts and it's fact checking them, but it's finding all these people that have shared it and are assuming that it's correct because all these people shared it has to be right. Yeah, it seems like a small irony. The more you teach an AI, the better it performs, much like a human. Oh, good point. Yeah, think about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, like you feed a, a child like a certain biased propaganda right. that's going to grow up to believe that right well, yeah, maybe um, that's why like a actually lot of I, I, there's a there's a good beliefs. example of that uh with neo-nazism you you have you know these neo-nazis living in america who are raising their children with these viewpoints and and these kids are coming out and growing up and having these these exact viewpoints well, and you know not saying that they're you know mass murderers shooting up malls and shit, but like a lot of them, you know, a lot of them do come out screwed up. But it's like their the viewpoints of their parents become their viewpoint because that's all they've ever known. Josh, yeah, they're indoctrinated. <laughs> um, they're indoctrinated, right? So yeah. they think like so it's, it's yeah. like oh, you know, my parents taught me both, you know, that yeah. white people are Question superior everything. and black people are need to be oppressed and. Which kind of brings us back to creativity and, you know, having yeah. your own stuff instead of just learning it or having another thing think or do things for you. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's actually where this whole theme of this podcast is coming together, that the main, like, thing is don't let other things think for you. 
be free yeah, absolutely exactly. be free be power creative, to the people be original yeah. and don't let society just oppress you and push you down you know don't let Figuring. society and ai and, and 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 bigger people that are that are that make themselves feel bigger than you at your expense push you down you know, constantly push forward power to the people push down when you push down you step you come back up why I do think we fall people so be like get. a boogie board in a pool when somebody pushes you down bring back up and slam them in the face that's right. I think people get lost in thinking they have no power, and they really do. It's an astonishing amount of power. Like, look, we didn't we didn't get to take control of the planet mm-hmm. by sitting on our ass. That's true. Look at how we're much power. Of, we're, we're not top of the food chain for no reason. Look at how much and you one... have power, and you have choice. And and speaking on a personal note, this helped me a lot when I was in college and going through some crises and counseling things like that. They said, you know, you have an astonishing amount of power. Use it. You have a vote. You have a voice. Even complaining on the internet, even though it's a half solution, is is kind of a solution. Oh, yeah. Figuring things out for yourself is the only freedom anyone really has. Yeah, look how much power one whistleblower has. You know, one person can change the world. True. You know, there's a... Free. Sorry, go ahead. Sean's just free, saying some bullshit. <laughs> no, I was saying there's a... Free Edward Snowden. Back in the 80s, Miller uh, wrote a Daredevil comic. Uh, well, no, not, not Edward Snowden. Um, WikiLeaks. They just Julian freed Assange. WikiLeaks. Yeah. He, they converted his sentence to time served for being in the French prison for however long. He might have to serve a little bit of house arrest when he gets back here to the United States, or gets back to Australia. But essentially, the U.S. has cleared him of all charges, of, has cleared him and has told him, you're welcome back in the U.S. if you ever want to come. <laughs> Sweet. What were you saying, Chris? It's a shit oh, I was just going to say, you know, back in the 80s, you guys ever read Daredevil Born Again? There's oh, I have it. Where- where Yurik, no. you know, he's a reporter for the Bugle, right? And he's going after the kingpin, and he's experiencing some doubt. And Jameson walks up to him, and he says, look, this is a newspaper. It deposes presidents. It informs millions of people. And it's been gunning for the kingpin for years. It's a free press. Use it. That's a good point. Is yeah. That, um, is that, that uh, Frank Miller? Yeah. Frank this is, is kind of a, before graphic, Miller went nuts. Is that a, is that a graphic novel or? Yeah, yeah. I it. wrote it in the monthly Daredevil series in '86, but it's been collected on its own. It's part of Born Again. Oh, oh I thought check it out. Yeah. Sorry, it's he it, it said it's a. I, I you cut out. I didn't hear what you said. Sorry. So, comic recommendations here on the podcast. <laughs> uh, he wrote it in the monthly Daredevil series in '86, but it's been collected oh, on its okay. own since. Oh. Oh, nice. Uh, you said you have it, Dom. Yeah, and I was just thinking, um, Chris. I know you'd be really good for this. What yeah. if we do like comic or graphic novel examinations hell on yes. the podcast? I'm like, there. The true oh, meaning. Hell yeah. Oh hell yeah. I've I, been the... meaning to read more into Batman Eternals. Um, I'm a couple pages in and like just I started read All-Star really into Superman. it. Superman. I've had that forever. Like, oh man. All-Star what's the Superman. true meaning? I gotta memorize. What's the true meaning of the killing joke? Like what happened at the end? You know stuff like oh, that. Oh, I like, think Batman and Joker killed each other. Yeah, or he just killed him. Hmm. Yeah, I think they killed each oh, other. Oh yeah, that's. I think that's the one where Batman just snaps Joker's neck and then steps out of the Batmobile with his body. And he's like, I didn't help. <laughs> well, it ends with like them laughing after this joke the Joker tells. But I read an interview years ago, and I think it was with Alan Moore. And he's like, oh, yeah, he kills him. And I was like, oh, okay. Damn, all right, shit. All right, <laughs> so over. anyways, because well, we're going to segue into a, a comic uh, thing. I think that wraps everything up. Sorry. I think, no, it's fine. But we, we definitely should do that no, maybe for the next one. Um, yeah, absolutely. next next podcast graphic novels. Yeah, I'm down, and I have thoughts about V for Vendetta. So <laughs> Stanley, I, I can go over. Oh yeah, oh, I'd Watchmen. love to read the graphic novel for that. We could go over Watchmen. We could go over Watchmen. Too. Over Watchmen. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so much has been said, but I think we can make novel. it. Actually, um, need to watch. What's really interesting? My read. vacation to New York City next uh, next month, beginning of August. I am staying at a, a place called Hotel Boutique, and it's actually right across the street from Midtown Comic Bo- uh, Comic Books. Ooh, go there. It's a great store. Oh, yeah. Definitely going to go check it out. Is that like a big comic store in New York? It's huge. Yeah, there's two of them in New York City, but they're like multi-leveled comic book stores. Okay. Damn. Isn't one of them in Times Square just off? There's one in ju- uh, just off Times Square, and then the other one is over by uh, – 
uh, Grand Central Station, which is where I'm staying. What are you going to New York for, just for a little trip? Or? Um, well, I'm going down for vacation for a week, but I also got uh, tickets to go see Green Day's Saviors Tour. I got uh, pit tickets. So. Look at you. With the tattoo to match. That's right. Yeah. Billy, look, it's me. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for uh, listening to the podcast. Uh, whether you're watching on YouTube or Spotify, I appreciate the support. And, uh, yeah, I'll we'll probably be doing the graphic novel one next. But thank you for listening. Thank you, Chris, Mike, and Sean, for your insightful uh, conversation. And uh, I hope people have enjoyed listening. Yeah, absolutely. I, had a, I would love doing these and uh, can't wait to do the next one. Thank have you, a good sir. Good night, folks. And. Uh... And uh, uh, vote Alexander Scott. Yeah, vote Alexander Scott. Vote Alexander Scott. Hail Salatium. <laughs> Hail Salatium. Night, guys.